Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us to discuss a variety of issues, including the practice of pension spiking by some city employees. And we'll try to find out what's funny with humorist Lori Nataro. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The issues of pension fairness in general and pension spiking in particular are both front and center at Phoenix City Hall. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us tonight to discuss those and other city concerns. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Happy to be here. Let's define terms. What is pension spiking? Well, that's exactly what we have a ad hoc committee uh, doing. This is a very complicated issue. Nobody likes the idea of pension spiking, but getting to a legal definition of it, uh, what within our compensation is spiking, what isn't spiking. You know, a lot of these policies have been in place for two decades or uh, more, and so we're going to go back a lot of history and relook at some of our policies and says what is fair moving forward? What, how can we be most uh, transparent? You know, we did pass pension reform last March, which is going to save the city a lot of money. We did eliminate some pension spiking already through union uh, contracts. We're in litigation over that right now, and so when that case comes uh, to a decision, we'll have m more of the contours of what we can do and can't do, because a lot of it has to do with what you can do moving forward for new employees or prospectively versus retrospectively. Uh, and as you know, usually when you do anything retrospectively, the uh, plaintiffs have been successful mm -hmm. in that litigation. So we don't know what's going to happen in ours, but that's ongoing uh, right now. And now we're making some recommendations moving forward, making sure we're following the law and also what's right, what's the right thing to do. In general terms, unused sick and vacation time counted toward your pension payout. The idea is that it inflates your end of career compensation, a general definition of pension spiking. Yeah, anything. So, so you know, uh, your pension is determined by an average of your last three years. So anything that would sort of artificially inflate uh, those last few years is what we're going to look at. Look, I, I don't, my goal, and, and I think the goal of the majority of the council, is not to drive down compensation in the city of Phoenix. We want to make sure that we are compensating our, our employees. We have outstanding employees in the city of Phoenix, very, very talented people. There's a reason why we have maintained a AAA credit rating uh, even throughout the economic downturn. We are a well-run city. We're not a perfect city, but we are a well-run city. The goal is not to drive down compensation uh, the goal is to be as transparent and as fair as possible. And some of the practices, again, that have been in place for multiple decades, I think most people, including myself, have said, look, we need to, we need to uh, change those policies so that it's more transparent to the public so they know exactly what the uh, pension is going to be based upon. And, and taking some information here from the Arizona Republic, they've done a lot of reporting sure, of on this. Mm -hmm. they, they're leading the, the charge on this. Um, spiking is allowed, this pension spiking is allowed for some workers, not others. True? Sure, just like I would say that uh, there have been different pay scales for different uh, workers. There's di we have five different labor groups that we negotiate contracts with in the city of Phoenix. We don't have a uniform contract. We, we, we uh, contract individually with those very various uh, organizations, and we vote on it by a, a council. Just like, by the way, we voted on the city manager's contract by an eight-to-one vote uh, for the, for the uh, current city manager's contract. We voted to kind of keep the current policies in place. I think myself and others have said when we hire a new city manager and we're among all the other issues we're dealing with, we're in the process of hiring uh, a new city manager. We said we're going to eliminate pension spiking in any future city manager contract because leadership starts at the top. And so to the extent that there have been differences within that system, part of this ad hoc committee is to come to uniform definitions as to what is pension spiking so that as we adopt the policy, we can be as fair to everyone across the board. I, 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 the fairness issue comes up again because the idea of the city council fighting the rank and file from pension spiking, there is also reports, there are reports uh, that executive upper level management, the fight isn't quite so strong against them and their pension striking. Is that accurate? Is that fair? Well, I th as it results, as the issue of the city manager uh, and some of the things we've discovered uh, recently regarding the, uh, uh, the city manager's uh, contract, I think that is a fair criticism. It's exactly why we said immediately uh, that w for the new city manager contract, we're going to make sure that we eliminate any pension spiking in it. So the whole point of this current ad hoc committee, we've given them one month to come up with their recommendations, is to make the system as fair and transparent across the board. Let me reiterate. We have outstanding employees in the, in the city uh, in the city of Phoenix. 
Uh, we, have, we have to make sure that we compensate our employees fairly so that we can attract and retain the very best people. We're an important entity in this organization. We don't want to pay people such a low amount that we don't attract high quality people, but we want to do it in the most fair and transparent way. And that's, that's the reason why we're going through this important process of eliminating pension spiking. So if you were to kind of go say, you treated this group one way, this group mm -hmm. differently, the point is this is exactly why we're going through the ad hoc process, the, the committee right now chaired by Vice Mayor uh, Bill Gates, a, a fair and even-handed and really intelligent member of my council uh, who's leading uh, this ad hoc committee. And that's we're going to kind of lay the, the foundation for uniform uh, recommendation on pension spiking. That's the whole reason why we're doing it. Okay, so it has happened. Uh, you and others say it's not necessarily fair as it exists. Time to change. Ad hoc committee is going ahead with the changes. Still in all, how does a city manager wind up with, I think the Republic had worked it out to be over $200,000 per year pension, and then the next day takes a job somewhere else? I mean, I understand the changes. It sounds like the changes were needed. How did it get to that in the point to begin with? Was, was anyone not watching that particular store? Well, it, it, here's the deal. Uh, we want to make sure that our city manager, by the way, just like we want to make sure for our employees up and down the line, are paid a competitive compensation uh, package. So it, we knew it was controversial when we gave a salary increase to our city manager, but if you look at other city managers for city our size, we're act still actually at the relatively uh, low end of that, uh, of that scale. At the end of the day, um, the city manager, you pay your city manager what he or she is worth, not because of that individual person, but you want to make sure you have a a compensation system that allows you to be competitive in case your city manager leaves or retires so you have a pay scale that is uh, that is fair. We want to be a most competitive city so people want to stay. I wish Mr. Cavazos nothing but the best in his next position and I want to hire a city manager as we're going through the process now that stays well beyond my two terms as mayor and probably well beyond the terms of the existing council members. You want to, you want to get someone that's going to stay for the long haul and you could only do that if you have a, a great system under which to operate and a competitive compensation system. And yet one more point on sure, this. It, it can be argued that you got the guy the raise. You got the guy the humongous raise in tough times and through criticism. I was, you said uh, only one negative vote there on the city council. It was eight to one uh, vote. Council Marion voted no on the okay. contract. You yeah. got him the raise, poof, he's gone anyway. I mean, it, 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 that doesn't necessarily guarantee, again, we're arguing from the other sure. side here, doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're going to stick around. Let me tell you something right now. The police chief could resign tomorrow and leave for another uh, job. The head of our public works department, the head of our parks department. Uh, you want to make sure that you have an overall competitive compensation. Don't want to pay too much, don't want to pay too little. You want to have a competitive compensation system. You want to make sure you're bringing in top people and you want to have a work environment that they, that they want to uh, stay in. Uh, and we're running a very important organization uh, in, the, in this a very large organization, important uh, organization. But we don't have a system where you, 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 have, where you tell people you, you, can't, you have to stay forever. Sure, sure. You have the ability uh, to leave. And again, Mr. Cavazos, I wish him nothing but the best in the next position. As mayor, I'm looking forward to the next city manager as well as how to lead the city forward so we can be one of the leading economic cities in the country and the world. That's what I'm going to continue to focus in on as mayor. How is that process going? For the, for the city for manager the search city or manager. making our city economically yes. better. We can talk about both. Well, what, uh, I just want to know. It, it, sure. I, so, we have, so the city council has made a decision that the assistant city manager, Ed Zerker, an outstanding uh, professional within our city, will be the acting city manager. In the meantime, we are going to do a national search because it's important that a city of our size and importance in this country do a national search for our for our. Uh, city manager. So we want to make sure that we get the best and the brightest resident uh, people to apply for that gig and we also give a full and fair opportunity for our most talented people within our organization that they have the opportunity to compete for that uh, job. We have top talent within the city that we think can compete nationally but it would be inappropriate for us not to engage in our national search. So we are just beginning the national search process and we should check in regularly, as I often do, since I'm on the show regularly. I can give you updates on how the process is going. Okay, fair enough. Last question on pension spiking. Is, is, how much is it impacting the retirement systems? I mean, if it's a 42% increase from just three years ago, the retirement system, the payout, the, what, what's the obligations there? I mean, we've got one council member saying we're headed to becoming the next Detroit if we don't change things around. What's going on there? Phoenix is a very well-managed city. Look, we are the only big city of the top 10 city, the only big city with that triple A 
uh, credit rating. We're going to keep that. We have the highest. Keep it? We, well, we have gone through a recent reevaluation of some of our transit uh, dollars, and we were recently reevaluated by Moody's, who did give us a triple A. Uh, once again, look, we're not a perfect city. We face challenges like every other uh, big city. But people that engage in hyperbole to make a political point to s- is kind of scare tactics. That's uh, inappropriate. We ought to deal with the facts as they are. Look, we needed to ensure that our employees paid more into the pension system. That's exactly why we put pension reform on the ballot. And guess what? Despite the opposition of the council member that you're referencing, it passed with an 80 percent vote of the people, which is going to put hundreds of millions of additional dollars into the pension system. The whole point was to make sure that we did all we can to uh, support the pension system and keep it there for the long run. It was a more fair system. We're going to, if we decided to keep uh, the city employees in a pension system, it was important that they pay more into that system in order to receive that pension. That's exactly what pension reform was all about. It's exactly why we did it, and the voters overwhelmingly supported the, the reforms we made to our, uh, our pension system. And we'll find out what that, at that four council member committee does uh, coming up here shortly. I in one imagine. month, so in next time month. I'm back, I'll be able to All right. back on some, how we Some did. say in one month is too long, but one month will have to do, correct? To, to, to actually to make these tough decisions, both from deciding what the right thing to do as well as the legal constraints in which we operate. Okay. Uh, a, a one month was the appropriate amount of time. I can't let you go. We only got a couple minutes left sure. here. We talked so much about pensions, but we got to talk about it. Uh, trip to China. What was that all about? Well, I was uh, lucky enough to be invited to the World Economic Forum, a meeting in Dalian, China. Dalian is a city, a kind of a resort city in China near the North Korean border, a very small Chinese city of six million people, which would make it about the third biggest city in the United States uh, of America. And uh, it was a very exclusive group. I was able to I have meetings with CEOs of some of the major Fortune 500 multinational uh, corporations, including many that have operations here in uh, Phoenix, and have a chance to talk to the key decision maker within those organizations to make the case as to why additional investment in Phoenix uh, is important. I did also have a chance to serve on a panel, a panel discussion of urban leaders around the world, including leaders from Beijing and uh, Shanghai and, and Tokyo, and I was bragging about how Phoenix is the fifth or sixth biggest city uh, in, in the United States of America with one and a half million people, and uh, the urban planner from Beijing said that would barely put you in the top 100 in China. Uh, so I'll it's bet. a very humbling uh, realization that, uh, at least on population, we have a long way to go. And, of course, our economic relationship with China in the Asian world is critically important moving forward, and Phoenix has to ins- to create an identity, an international identity, so people know the value of investment in our city. Okay, good enough. We've got about 30 seconds sure. left. Do you think the... Me- I'm going back to pensions. Funding. Sure. Do you think the message is getting through and the confidence is there among citizens that this will be handled correctly? Because right now, it sounds like a big old mess. Well, uh, look, we... People suggested that pension reform would never occur. We did uh, uh, pension reform. Uh, yes, we're hearing from the public as we should, but more importantly, we're trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. My leadership style is always going to be to, to move forward with what I believe is the right thing for the future of our city and let the political chips fall where they uh, may. Again, the idea, we have outstanding employees at the city. The idea is not to drive down compensation, but rather have a more fair, transparent system. And we're going to get there and check with me in a month. All right. We will do that. Mayor, good to see you. Thank you. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. 
Get the 8 Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Best-selling author and former ASU student and professor Lori Nataro will discuss her approach to writing humor at an ASU Project Humanities Forum that's taking a serious look at what's considered funny. I recently spoke with Lori Nataro about the art of being a humorist. Good to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Ted. Yes. It's a pleasure. And I, we, we can, we'll talk after the show, but okay. we've known each other for quite a while, and I've been able to watch you develop from this, this person who told a lot of funny jokes and laughed out loud quite a bit to someone who really is, I mean, you are an Fat. arbiter. <laughs> <laughs> an arbiter of what's funny. So you're, spe you're, you're speaking at this forum in the whole nine yards. Lori Nataro, what is funny? I think funny encapsulates a lot, but in a nutshell, I think it's tragedy and humiliation plus a day, pretty much. Interesting. Sometimes it takes more than a day, as I've learned in therapy. Sometimes it takes Ativan and a day and the tragedy. Sometimes it works out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when you take Ativan, almost everything is funny. It's, <laughs> so that's, I see. yeah, that works out well. Is it the old, I remember the old Dick Van Dyke show? Uh -huh. and there was an episode where Rob Petrie goes to his kid's class. He's a comedy writer, and they say what's funny, and he can't figure out, and he slips on a banana peel, and the kids all laugh, and he goes, that was funny. It was unexpected. When you're writing, can you, can you transform that into the written word? Well, you know what happens pretty much, and it's become a process. I didn't realize that I was doing this. Mm -hmm. It was my husband that said, that kind of notified me, put on red alert. This is what you're, I, I hate the word process. I hate it. But this is the way my brain works when I'm working on something, is that something terrible will happen. For example, I, we had homeless people living in our backyard, which generally speaking, no one would really find that too funny. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I would end up doing is telling my mother that this happened, you know, oh, the homeless guy built a bridge into the backyard. Oh, the homeless guy now has his stuff in our bushes. Oh, the homeless guy is now sleeping back there like a deer. And then he was starting to do other unmentionable things in my backyard as well. So I'll tell my mom, and then I'll tell my sister or my friend. And it's then that I'm getting the rhythm down, and I'm, I'm developing kind of the way that that story is going to roll and the way that it's going to go. And I didn't realize that I was doing that. So there is a rhythm and a timing involved. Is there, oh, is, yeah. does it all lead up to a, is it all setting up to, I hate to use the word punchline or the phrase sure. punchline, but is, is that what it's leading up to? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, you've, you have to have the conflict. There's got to be a conflict in comedy. There can't be any, nothing is funny without conflict. Then that's just happy. And funny isn't happy. Do you think, when, okay, homeless people in your backyard. Yeah. Now you start writing. Are you thinking in terms of a payoff or is the payoff somewhere out there and I'll get to it when I get to it? Sometimes it happens like that, yeah. I mean, that whole story didn't, didn't have an ending. It was just a guy sleeping in my backyard until we were sighted by the city to clean up our bushes. And when I went in there and found what he had in there, and then it looked like there was a corpse back there. And then I had a dead hobo to deal with, which is really not funny. Yes. Um, and then that was it, when we realized that it was, it was just kind of like mummified hobo stuff that was in there and not actually a body. So that, that was kind of happy. He wasn't dead, not well, body. Yeah, that, that's a good thing, that he so, wasn't dead. Right. Um, when you're writing this down, do you laugh out loud? Not usually right away. Sometimes I will. Like I just kind of made a jerk out of myself downstairs in the Hall of Fame at the Cronkite because someone I hate is on that wall and I'm not on that wall. Um, and I did something very immature. And I'll laugh at it later. Right now I'm still mortified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when you're actually writing the column. Do I laugh? Yes. So, it's, I do. Okay. I do. So uh, with, with that in mind, are you writing for you or are you writing oh. for someone else? Always me. Always me. Always, always, always. And I learned this when I was working at The Republic and when I was working at State Press here at ASU, was I had some editors that would try to change punchlines and would try to change the rhythm. And I thought, you know what? If I'm going to take flack for something that's going to fall flat, it better be mine. Yes. My name is on it, and it better be my work. So therefore, when I sit down to write, it has to make me laugh. And if it doesn't make me laugh, then I throw it away. Are you ever surprised at things that you didn't think? Did you, are you ever surprised that people will laugh or think something's really funny? That's not the punchline. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Sometimes every now and then there'll be something that I didn't think was, it was kind of like a throwaway, like a bee joke or something. And yeah. it wasn't the big punch. And they'll go crazy over that. And then maybe the big punchline will be lost on them. How often is your humor? Let's say that they, they got the punchline. They didn't like the punchline. Yeah. How often is your humor taken completely wrong? Oh, I think that there are many times just because humor is so completely subjective. And I think you and I have a similar sense of humor, but my mother and I do not have a similar sense of humor at all. And when you promise someone that you're going to make them laugh and they don't, they have a tendency to get infuriated, angry, and then they go to Amazon and write nasty comments about you. <laughs> yes, they do. So yeah, if you make, if you make the promise, you spend twelve ninety five on this book and I'm going to make you laugh and you don't, it's the wrath of the, it's insane. How much does the wrath of the insane, how much are they on your shoulder as you're writing going, that's not funny, that's not funny? Well, I don't, I, <laughs> It's not so much that's not funny, it's Lori that's completely tasteless. Ah. It's more like that. Just because I have I have few boundaries. Very few boundaries. I'll write about anything. Well with that in mind, when is funny not funny? Oh, when you're sober. <laughs> <laughs> Drinks always help. <laughs> Drinks. It, I think that funny is not funny if you haven't if you haven't developed it. You have to. You've got to set the staircase up for it. You've got to really do a good backstory, um, so that everybody understands where it is you're coming from, what your perspective is, and so they get exactly what you're saying when you go to hit, make that punch. Well, it, okay. Let, let, from a different angle, same kind of a question: Is funny funny when it's also hurtful? Yeah, I'm afraid so. I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid. Sometimes it's even funnier then. Um, and it's, when I was working at the state press, there were times when I, I would take jabs at a situation or a person in that situation, and even in the Republic, I would because I figured, well, you did it. Yes. You know, you did that. I'm just I'm just retelling the story. And if you did something ridiculous, then I have every right to kind of alert the public to that. However. And some of those things were really funny. Um, and when I take jabs at my mother, that's very funny. It does hurt her feelings, though. How does she feel about that? Oh, she hates that part of me. <laughs> <laughs> she told me this morning she was going to sue me. So I said, well, that's fine, but that'll be a witness on my side, so knock yourself out. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And by the way, a column is coming from you the minute we hit the courtroom. Right. <laughs> um, our, I always ask this about creative people, and I, so I'm, I'm curious. When is I, I kind of know a little bit because we've know, we've gone back quite a bit, and right. I remember your writing when you started and how it's developed, and it's very impressive, and we're all very proud of you. However, when did you know that not just a writer? When did you know that I'm I'm funny and I'm good at this? I don't. I still don't know that. I still don't know that. You know, there, there are many, many people who don't think that I'm funny. And I'm not sure when you finally have that realization that you're funny. I'm not sure when David Sedaris did or when uh, Larry David had that realization. And maybe they don't care. Maybe it's just what, re what, what is kind of insular to them. And I am kind of that way. I'm, I think that mainly there's, I, if I think it's funny and my husband thinks it's funny, then I'm kind of okay with that. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that there was ever a time, especially when I was working at the State Press, I just kind of, you know, I fell into that because I was the editor of the magazine and my humor columnist was in jail for being a drunk driver and missed his deadline. So I just had to come up with something really fast and I just kind of kept doing that week after week. Is it easier now than it was then? Um, I hope it's better. Mm -hmm. I hope it's better. Is it easier? Um, it's it's never, it's so much fun though that it's not really yeah. that hard. I hate writing. Mm -hmm. I do hate writing, but it's more that I, I hate deadlines and yeah. I really hate writing. Last question. Now you lived in Arizona for so long, then you hightailed it up to Oregon where you're still living. Mm -hmm. Are people funnier in Arizona or in Oregon? Arizona. Hands down. <laughs> How come? Hands down. Um, I'm not sure if it's because the Republicans are more funny, I'm, but I think that where I live now in Oregon is a, is a very, very liberal place, and I'm fine with that. I really, really am. But it, they're so liberal and so um, open-minded that they're, they're offended at everything that I say. And I've gotten almost booed off the stage for depicting an Italian accent 
but yet those are my people. Wow. <laughs> So I thought, wow, okay, you can talk about anything else over there. You can talk about child prostitution. They laugh at that. They laugh at scatological stuff. They love it when girls are dating married men, but you make fun of an Italian of whom <laughs> they probably never met, and the whole show is over. But Arizona's funnier, huh? I think so. All right. I think so. Well, it's good to see you again. Great Congratulations you. on all your success, continued success. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ted. And Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, it's the 10-year anniversary of Orizonte on ATV. We'll visit with Orizonte host Jose Cardenas, and we'll learn about a report on American Indians in Arizona. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.